All right, staying fresh. Let's look at some rule scenarios so we can sharpen our saw and be ready for anything that happens on the court. Let's go. Stick around. <laughs> Greetings. Welcome back to the Basketball Rules Expert. Let's look at some play scenarios today so that we can get better as basketball officials. And when are we going to do that? We're going to do that starting right now. A1 dives for a loose ball and grabs it. B1 knocks the ball from A1's hands just as Team A coach starts yelling for a timeout. Just as B2's imminent possession of the loose ball, an official grants Team A a timeout. The officials rule that the timeout shall be granted, but Team B will get the subsequent throw-in as their possession was imminent when the whistle blew. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? So, this may or may not have happened in my game. <laughs> A1 dives for a loose ball and is holding the ball on the floor. The ball is deflected from their hands just as the Team A coach starts yelling, Time out, time out, time out! Right? And just as B is about to pick it up, an official grants the timeout to Team A. The ball is loose, but it is about to be possessed by Team B. The officials rule that the timeout shall be granted and award the ball to Team B as they were imminent possession was uh, in effect. Were the officials correct, yes or no, right? So I, I believe at the NBA level, when they go to play review, imminent possession becomes a factor. And if a team was had imminent possession, they end up uh, sort of fast forwarding and saying they would have gotten the ball, et cetera. But in NFHS, that is simply not a thing. That does not a factor. So in this instance, we had team control on the court by team A. The ball was deflected and became loose. And during that loose ball scenario, a timeout was granted to Team A. How will we resume in this situation? Our officiating crew has made a mistake in granting the timeout. We have to recognize that fact, but we're going to have to go to the point of interruption. And what was that point of interruption on this play? Team A control of the ball, right? We erroneously granted because we did not have player control when the request was made and the timeout was granted we have made that mistake but we go to point of interruption and we we uh, award the ball to team a in this instance so in this instance where the officials gave possession to team b were the officials correct in this instance yes or no 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 they were not we would award the ball to team a we have to, in this instance, fall on our sword, recognize the situation, but proceed by rule. That's always our guidance. That's always the way we have to make things happen. On the court. Don't know why that changed there. So I had this happen in my game. We did not we did not award the ball to Team B. I thought, you know, threw that in. But my partner um, granted the timeout. The ball was clearly loose. In that situation, uh, before they go and report, um, I, I tell, you know, he comes to me, we talk it through. I say, the ball was definitely loose, but we did have Team A control. You've granted the timeout. We're going to grant the timeout. We're going to resume with Team A, spot nearest to where the ball was. And that's how it goes. The eruption was from the opposing, uh, the opposing bench. We're going to have to have a discussion with them as they recognize that the ball was loose. Yeah, that was the situation. That was the situation. It occurred in front of the opponent's bench. So they were <laughs> they were actively involved on that play. Hey, thanks for joining us today for the Basketball Rules Expert. Appreciate you being here. This is the show where we take National Federation of High School Basketball Rules and lift them off of the printed page. 
try to breathe life into them, simplify and clarify the rules so we can take them with us onto the basketball court. My name is Greg Austin with A Better Official. We craft video to help basketball officials get better. And this show is all about helping officials have a better understanding of the rules, National Federation of High School Basketball rules, so that we can take it with us onto the basketball court. And with that, let's move on to our very next play. A1 grabs the ball after a made basket to begin the throw-in process. He has one foot out of bounds and one foot on the court. A1 then throws the ball to A2, who has both feet in bounds. A2 dribbles the ball up the floor. The officials rule a throw-in violation on Team A. Were the officials correct? Yes or no, right? Scored goal, player gets the ball out of the basket, steps mostly out of bounds. They have one foot out of bounds, one foot in bounds. Releases a throw-in pass to a teammate who's inbounds. The teammate dribbles up the floor. And the official says, hold on, hold on. I have a violation. That is a throw-in violation by rule. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? In this instance, they would be correct because we have case play to support that our thrower must be out of bounds. Now, even though they have one foot out of bounds and one foot inbounds, which gives them out-of-bounds status, they must have nothing in bounds in order to release a throw-in pass. So in this instance, where the officials ruled a throw-in violation, were the officials correct? Yes or no? Indeed. Indeed, they, yes, they were. This would be a throw-in violation by rule. Simple, straightforward, easy play. One that, though, that could, you know, throw a curveball every now and again. At us, throw in a curveball, and we're moving on. A1 drives to the basket, releases the ball for a try, and then contacts B1. The ball passes through the basket, whistles from both lead and center, lead signals a block, center signals a charge. The officials rule. The officials score the goal, report both fouls, and resume with a non-designated spot throw-in to Team B. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Here we have it, boys and girls, a large scenario. Block charge play, one official has a block, one official has a charge. The ball goes through the basket. The officials count the goal? and resume at a point of interruption, a non-designated spot throw-in. Is that the correct adjudication of this play at the high school level? When this happens in your game, if we're not prepared and we have to try to sort this out on the court, that's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a challenge. Okay, uh, a large scenario where we have fouls from two officials, conflicting calls. The correct ruling would be a double foul. Okay, so one official had block, one official had charge. This is a double foul. What do we know about double fouls? Do double fouls cause the ball to become dead when a try is in flight, which it was in this instance? No, no, they do not. So we have a live ball that passes through the goal. If we have a live ball that passes through the goal, are we going to score that goal? Yes, yes, we are. Also, with a double foul, no free throws will be awarded, right? That's important to understand. And we're going to resume at the point of interruption. What's the point of interruption on this play? Well, the ball's passed through the goal, so the opponent will get a non-designated spot throw in on the end line. So the Blarge rears its head. Our officials, in this instance, did they correctly adjudicate this play? Yes. Yes, they did ruled a double foul, reported both fouls, scored the goal, resumed at the correct point of interruption. That is how you handle a Blarge situation. Hey, we've got a tremendous group of show supporters. Let's take a look. Who is up on the show supporter big board this week? 
Brett Temple, David Yanikian, Jonathan Harris, Herb Hahn, and Roger George. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? There'll always be a link down in the show notes below, and you know I'm going to put one up above. All right, let's look at our next play. A1 is driving to the basket for a breakaway lay-in. While the ball is on the rim, B1, who is trailing the play, intentionally strikes the backboard and causes the ball to fall off of the rim. The officials rule basket interference, score the goal, and assess a player technical foul on B1. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Right? Player goes for a layup, but while the ball is on the ring, intentionally slapping the backboard by the opponent, causes the backboard to shake, the ball rolls off. The officials say, score the goal, basket interference, player technical for intentionally striking the backboard and moving forward from there. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? The most misunderstood application of basket interference on this play. I don't know if uh, the rules are different at other levels. Definitely a factor that comes into play. But in high school, slapping the backboard, causing the backboard to vibrate, has no impact on a basket interference ruling. It is illegal to contact the backboard intentionally. It is not illegal to contact the backboard in the attempt to block a shot. That is a judgment by the officials. In this instance, the officials, their judgment was this was an intentional act. This is a player technical foul. That would be correct. But the awarding, scoring of the goal is not correct by rule at the National Federation of High School level. So in this instance, where the officials scored the goal, by ruling basket interference, as well as the player technical, were they correct, yes or no? No, not in this instance. The correct ruling here would be player technical, but no scoring of the goal related to a basket interference violation. Let's go. Dribbling on a fast break, A1 is outside the three-point arc and throws a pass towards A2. The ball deflects off of defender B1's head, bounces high in the air, and then passes through the goal. The officials rule that since this was not a try for goal, only score, only two points shall be scored. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Wow. So players dribbling down the side, you know, throws a pass to a teammate. The ball hits a defender in the head, bounces high up in the air, and goes through the basket. You don't see that every day, but you may see it in Five Play Friday this week, right? So this play happens. This can catch us off guard. What are we going to need to do? We're going to need to make the proper ruling about how many points shall be scored. In this instance, the officials ruled that only two points were scored. This was not a try. It was obvious. It was obviously a pass. It wasn't directed towards the goal. It was obviously a pass to a teammate. The ball bounces high in the air and goes in. The officials say this was not a try. Therefore, it's going to be two points. Were the officials correct in this instance? By rule, National Federation of High School, any thrown ball from behind the three-point arc that passes through the goal is to be considered a three-point goal. By rule, whether it's a pass, whether it's a try, makes no difference. Important to understand that. This may be different from the rules at other levels. But in this instance, three points should have been awarded. So when the officials erroneously awarded only two points, were the officials correct? Yes or no? No. This would not be the correct ruling in this scenario. 
right? What are we going to, this scenario happens in your game. This is wildly unusual. It's going to potentially catch us off guard. We have to just recognize that. If we awarded two points in this scenario and then the game moved forward, at what point could we correct the error, right? Maybe we're processing, the game continues, we're processing, we recognize, hey, wait a minute, that should have been three points. At, to up until what point could we correct that? That would be a correctable error scenario. So even if we get it wrong on the first attempt, we have a little bit of time to make the correct adjudication on the play. But in this instance, our officials were incorrect in their ruling. A1, outside the three-point arc, in her front court, throws a cross-court pass to A2. The ball strikes the ring and goes into Team A's backcourt, where A3 retrieves the ball. The officials rule a backcourt violation on Team A. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Well, on our previous play, any ball thrown from behind the arc that goes through is to be considered a try. So this must have been a try for goal. If we have a try for goal, then we can't have a backcourt violation in this situation. That's what our brain tells us. But the previous play says if the ball passes through the goal, it's to be considered a try and scored as three points. But in the absence of the ball going through, the officials are still allowed to make judgments about whether a try has been attempted by a player or whether it was simply a pass. And so in this instance, where a player is, ta is passing from one play, a ball is being passed from one player to another, that does not end team control by rule. The other play says, well, if you all, the ball ultimately passes through, then it's to be considered a three. But that doesn't mean that it was a try um, at the outset. So in this instance, our officials ruled this to be a backcourt violation. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, they were. This would be a backcourt violation. There was no try for goal despite the ball contacting the ring. Again, this can cause us a moment where we're, uh, okay, what just happened, right? But if we recognize that it was simply a pass, there has been no ending of Team A's control. They were the last to touch in the front court, the first to touch in the back court. A back court violation would be the correct ruling on this play. A4 is penalized for a player technical foul. The coach for Team B tells the official that he or she wants substitute B6 to shoot the free throws for the technical foul. The officials do not allow B6 to shoot the free throws, stating that only the players who are officially in the game are allowed to attempt those free throws. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? This would not be a ruling that many officials would make. I hope, hold on. I wonder why that turned off. <laughs> right? Who can attempt technical foul free throws? Any player or eligible substitute. Super clear uh, by rule, we would allow those uh, that player to attempt those free throws. In this instance, a really straightforward play, one that we would not want to get wrong, but in this instance, did the officials get it wrong? Indeed, indeed they did. We would allow B6 to attempt those free throws by rule. A lot of words. In an attempt to dunk the basketball, A1 goes up but misses the dunk. The ball hits the ring and bounces up above the ring that has 
been pulled down by A1. As the ring is returning to its original position, the ball comes down and hits it, springing the ball high into the air where it then comes down and passes through the goal, having returned to its original position. Wow, that's a lot of words. The officials rule basket interference on A1. A1 goes up to dunk, throws the ball down with force, depresses the ring. As a result, the ball does not go pass through. The goal bounces up in the air. The ball comes down. The ring returns to its original position, causing the ball to shoot up in the air. But miraculously, it then passes through the goal. The officials rule a basket interference on A1. Is that the correct adjudication on this play? Why didn't they go there automatically? Hmm. Who knows? <laughs> this is a basketball basket interference violation by rule. The A depressed ring, even though brought to that position legally, as it was in this instance, that causes the, that contacts the ball, it be, is a basket interference violation by rule. So in this instance, where the officials ruled a basketball, basket, basket interference violation by rule were our officials correct yes or no yes yes they were this is the correct adjudication of this play the trampoline effect you can see it when the when the depressed ring returns to its original position contacts the basketball will send it in an unnatural um, acceleration upward and our officials made the correct ruling on this We're grooving. Team A has a throw in. A2, A3, and A4 and A5 take positions on the lane line. So close to each other that no defenders are able to fit between any of them without illegally displacing one of the other Team A players. The officials rule that room must be given for the defenders. Were the officials correct? Yes or no, right? Coach from the sideline calls stack one, right? Players line up in a stacked position on the lane line. And they, by design, are trying to get so close to each other that defenders can't fit between them. The uh, opponents are attempting to get in. The officials recognize this and say, hey, 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 you got to give them room. Right? Is that the correct ruling in this situation? No. No, it's not. There's no rules provision that says in this instance of players who are away from the, uh, the, the uh, sideline, from the boundary, who are away from the boundary, there's no provision in the rules that says the defenders are allowed in in that situation. Now, sometimes we may have a situation where defenders are trying to get in and we have during this dead ball period, we have some action between players that we need to address. But if the, if the Team A players in this instance had established that position before the defenders, they are entitled to those positions and there's no provision in the rule that says otherwise. There's a provision that when the players are close to the boundary, there is uh, uh, restrictions that come into play, but these players are not close to the boundary. They're in a stacked position on the lane line. So in this instance where the officials said, must make room and allow defenders in, were our officials correct? No, no, they were not. That would not be the correct way to approach the situation by rule. Team A is in the bonus. A1 is in the act of shooting, but has not released the ball. B2 pushes A2, who is setting a legal screen for A1. Official calls a foul on B2 just before A1 releases the ball for a try. The ball goes into the goal. The officials score the goal 
and award A2 the and one free throw. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right. We have a situation where A1 is in the act of attempting a try for goal, but has not released the ball. The ball is in their hand. An opponent fouls a teammate of our player who's attempting the try. Ultimately, the whistle is blown. The try is released. The ball passes through the goal. The officials score the goal and award A2 the and one free throw. I saw this on TV in an NBA game, right? Okay, right. So we have a situation where we have a continuous motion applies in this situation. We have a foul by any defender during the habitual throwing motion of shooter A1. Continuous motion shall apply. The foul does not cause the ball to become dead. The result of the try shall count. We will score that goal. What do we have, though, on the foul? We have to penalize the foul. Team A is in the bonus, so A2 will be awarded bonus free throws in this situation. At other levels, in the NBA specifically, they have, some, uh, they have a unique rule here that the the player who was fouled gets the gets at one free throw in an and one situation. But in this situation, bonus free throws would be awarded to the fouled player. Super simple, very straightforward. So in this instance, our officials are rewarded only one as sort of the and one as a result of the try to the teammate of the player who scored the goal were the officials correct in this instance? No, no, this is not the correct application of rules, National Federation of High School Basketball rules. Again, just bringing into the fact we do see rules applied at other levels. We have to be aware of those, that those are very unique and distinct and not a part of National Federation of High School Basketball rules. <laughs> While bringing the ball up the floor under pressure in the backcourt, A1 releases the ball for a pass to A2 in the frontcourt. The covering official's count is at 9 seconds when the ball is released, but before the count, the count reaches 10, the ball bounces in the frontcourt. After the count reaches 10, the bounce pass is caught by A2. The officials rule this to be a legal play. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, tension is building. The account in the backcourt, a visible count in the backcourt, is at nine. Player throws the ball to a teammate in the front court. It's a bounce pass. It contacts the floor. But before the teammate catches the ball, the 10-second count is reached. The official says this is a legal play. Is that correct by rule? Understanding that the, 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 the requirement for a 10-second violation is a team that is in control must, the ball must gain front court status before the 10-second count is reached. In this instance, when the pass contacted the front court, the ball gained front court status status by rule. So whether or not a teammate then catches the ball is not a part of the requirement. So in this instance where the officials ruling was that this was a legal play, were the officials correct? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. This is the correct ruling on this play. Before the count reached 10, the ball gained front court status, rendering this a legal play by rule, we've got time for one more play scenario. After the referee has marked the designated sp throw-in spot on a backcourt sideline 
and the thrower has released the ball to a teammate in bounds in the backcourt, may the thrower run down the sideline out of bounds from the designated backcourt spot, throw in spot, and enter the front court in bounds and then receive a pass. A question is from Brian, Brian K. Right, so we have uh, this actually occurred. And if the officials uh, ruled this to be a legal play, would that be correct, let's say? No. <laughs> let's talk about all the things. Right, so Brian noted in a previous Five Play Friday video that a player released a throw in pass, ran down the sideline out of bounds, re entered the court, and it was not penalized. By rule, a player after releasing a throw in pass must return promptly to the court. They must step onto the court. If a player delays their return to the court, they are at risk for a player tactical foul. And that would be the correct ruling on this play. This is different from other levels. National Federation of High School Basketball rules if a player delays their return to the court, either uh, by not returning to the court in the spot where the throw-in was or moving in the out-of-bounds area and then returning to the court, this is a player technical foul by rule. So in the play scenario that we had on Five Play Friday, where this was ruled to be a legal play, were our officials in that instance correct? Yes or no? No. No, they were not. If recognized, this should be a player technical foul by rule. Thanks for joining Basketball Rules Expert today. Now would be a great time, if you haven't already, to do all the things. Hitting the like and the subscribe and the notify. You hit the like button. It really helps the show with the YouTube algorithm. Gets the show in front of more basketball officials. And we have to take a moment to thank our tremendous show supporters, Brett Temple, David Yanikian, Jonathan Harris, Herb Hahn, and Roger George. Much appreciated and much love. You want to support the show? There'll always be a link down in the show notes below, and you know I'm going to put one up above. We've got additional video content available for you here. I've made one choice. YouTube make one choice. You make one choice. And we'll see you in the very next video. Take care, everybody.